Again, what is the Pope? What is the office of the Pope? What does he do? Shepherd. Shepherd he shepherds the flock. Is he the ultimate shepherd? No. No. Christ is the ultimate shepherd, but he is the shepherd on earth the God to oversee the flock. Okay. Those are some Bible passages. I don't know how you can get around these that show us the primacy of the head apostle. But we're Bible Christians, right? There's more in the Bible. There's a lot more in the Bible that tells us that Peter was indeed the head shepherd, the leader of the apostles, the leader of the church. And let me just kind of give you some of the other things in the Bible that tell us this. First, in the New Testament, how many people did God change names? Of the whole entire New Testament, how many people did God change his name? Who was it? Peter. The only person in the New Testament that God changed a name was Peter. Why did God change people's names? Did he do it all the time? No, he did it very selectively. And when he did it, why did he change a person's name? For significance. Like Abram. Remember good old Abram? Way back in the New Testament, God changed his name to Abraham. Because he had a special significance for that person, a special role. So when God changes the name of a person, it's for a specific purpose in his salvation plan. And in the New Testament, he changes Peter. By the way, a little side note, Paul's name was not changed. You know Saul and Paul? God did not change his name. Do you know who changed his name? Luke, the gospel writer. He's the one who changed it. God did not change it from Saul to Paul. Why did he do that? Luke, Saul, Jewish name, Paul, Gentile name. Oh. Paul's now the apostle of the Gentiles, so Luke changes it in his thing. From Saul to Paul, saying that now it's Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, but God didn't okay. do it. Okay? Okay. So God changes the name of Peter from Simon to Peter. And what does Peter mean? Rocky. Rocky. He names him Rocky. All right? And somebody brought this up last week, the, you know, the name change. I looked it up. The word rock, he gave Peter the, the name rock. Rock was never given to anyone else because it was a sacred name. In the Old Testament, rock was given to, Christ, or to God. God was called the rock. But now in the New Testament, the only person God changed his name was to Peter, and now God changes Simon's name to Peter, which means rock. So that's significant. Okay. Another fact, when we read the New Testament, whose name do you think appears most often in the entire New Testament? Of all the apostles? Peter. Peter. Peter's listed 195 times in the New Testament. The second closest apostle is the apostle John, and his name is listed 29 times. Well, how many times? 195. Isn't that interesting? Of all the apostles, Peter's listed 195 times, and the second closest is John at 29. Okay? How about this? Whenever there's a list of apostles, guess whose name's first in the list? Peter. Peter. Why do you think that's the case? He's the head one. Right. Yeah. You know, if you were to say, let's let's let, 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 let's go give the the pre -peel people here at St. Pius. Let's list the key people at St. Pius. Who would be number one on the list? Father Fisher. Not me, him. <laughs> Father Fisher. Why? Because he's in charge. When you know, list. You know, the the, the government. You know, if you're going to list the pe key people in government, who's going to be the first person? George Bush. Because you always start with the leader. So Peter's name is always listed first whenever there's a, a list of um, apostles in the Bible. Also, we read the New Testament. Peter was a prime, the primary figure in, that new, in the early church. It was Peter. The first half of Acts of the Apostles is just about Peter. You know, Peter was a key people. He was always there on the, on the key components, the key events of that early church. Who was in charge of selecting Matthias in the very early church? 
It says Peter and the apostles. Who was there who proclaimed the basic gospel message at Pentecost? Peter. Tonight I'd like your help in my opening story. As you know, it always has deep theological significance, but I need your help this evening. So could you look up a, a Bible verse for me? Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 through 22. This is essential in our story tonight. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 through 22. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The Lord God then built up into a woman the rib that had been taken from the man when he brought her to the man. Okay, we all remember that account? Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's the story. When Adam stayed out very late for a few nights, Eve became very upset. Are you seeing other women, she asked. Eve, honey, you're being unreasonable, Adam responded. You know you're the only woman, woman on earth I really love. And also, we're married. The quarrel continued until Adam fell asleep, only to be awakened by a strange pain in his chest. It was his darling Eve poking him rather vigorously about the torso. As Adam woke up, he demanded, What do you think you're doing, Eve? Eve said, I'm counting your ribs. <laughs> <laughs> right out of the Bible. Now what can I say? <laughs> the church must have a single person who is given a special role of an authoritative leader of all the other ordained ministers. Okay, so summarizing. Remember, we're listing the ingredients for this true church. The true church must now have a single person who's given the special role of an authoritative leader over all of the ordained ministers. So another component. You see what we're doing? We're, starting, we're listing a lot of ingredients. And all these are important ingredients. And we can't, you know, just like a recipe. How many cooks do we have in here? So let's go ahead and read the next paragraph. Can somebody read the next paragraph? What, the ninth paragraph? There needs to be a way for the leaders of an organization to formally establish the beliefs or objectives. The leader and the successors of the apostles have the duty to infallibly define and protect Christ's teachings. Okay, now this is very important. Christ established, he gave authority to the apostles. He gave authority to one person to oversee the apostles. That's wonderful. Now this church has authority. How does it exercise its authority? What good is it if you, if you have it but don't know how to use it? So you think the Bible might tell us how the authority in the church can be used? Yes. Let's read about it. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 through 29. Again, Catholics, this, this passage is so essential in our Catholic faith. We need to know this. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 through 29. There's a lot of verses here, but let's read through it here. Let's get the feel of what's going on because it's so important understanding. Authority in the church. And I might stop you along the way. Some who had come down from Judea were instructing the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the Mosaic practice, you cannot be saved. Because there arose no little dissension and debate by Paul and Barnabas with them, it was decided that Paul, Barnabas, and some of the others should go up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem to the apostles and presbyters about this question. Okay, let's analyze this. Paul and Barnabas, they were ordained by the laying of hands. They were apostles. They were bishops. They had apostolic authority. They were out. They were out in Judea. And they were preaching. Okay? And then they ran into some dissension. <coughs> some people were saying things contrary to what Paul, the apostle, was teaching. Okay? To put it in perspective. 